Thank you, Melissa. So, three Frenchmen <laughs> were having a discussion on what would be a great example of the term savoir faire, which in French um, means know how, having great expertise, uh, mastery over something. And so the first Frenchman suggests, he says, ah, savoir faire is the husband, he comes home, he walks into the house, he says, Sherry, I'm home. But there is no Sherry. He walks through the house, no Sherry, he goes into the bedroom and, oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> Sherry and his best friend, Jacques, they are in the bedroom, um, you know, huh? <laughs> he is shocked. He wants to scream, but no, no. He takes a deep breath. He tiptoes out of the room, closes the door, and he goes and sits and waits patiently in the living room. That is savoir faire. <laughs> no, 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 pas du tout, pas du tout. Savoir faire is the husband. He comes in, hello, chérie, I'm home. There's no chérie. He goes to the house, he goes to the bedroom. Oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> chérie and his best friend Jacques, they are, you know. <laughs> he walks up to the bed. He says, pardon, madame et monsieur. He walks out of the room, he slams the door, and he waits patiently in the living room. That is savoir faire. The third Frenchman, ah, no, 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 pas du tout. Savoir faire is the husband, he comes home, hello, chérie, I'm home, there's no chérie, he goes to the bedroom, la, 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 chérie, Chuck. they are, you know. He walks up to the bed. He says, pardon, madame et monsieur. He walks out, he slams the door, and he waits patiently in the living room. And after that, if the wife is Sherry and Jacques is best friend, they can continue to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that is savoir faire. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> well, you know, in Signs of Mind, we're all about finding some redeeming feature. There's always some good, even those who are not showing up at their best. OK, so <laughs> this idea I wanted to look at today, hero today, villain tomorrow, is based on, you know, today, I'm sure many of you know, you may have been raised in a tradition that this is Palm Sunday, which commemorates Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with his followers laying down their cloaks and palm branches where we got the term Palm Sunday and singing his praises, Hosanna in the highest. Yet days later, he's crucified. And many of those same people are there crucifying. Now, in Science of Mind, we like to take every story, every event from scripture and interpret it metaphysically, meaning that every character, every event that unfolds is something, represents something in us, a way of thinking in us, a behavior in us. And so I thought we would look at this tendency to glorify and then crucify and see how that plays out in us, how we do that, how that kind of mind pattern um, exists in our own lives. So one of the core tenets of our teaching is that God is fully and equally present in everything and everyone, that all of us are imbued with God's nature 
That is our true nature. And we're all on a journey of awakening to that nature. The more we realize that essence of goodness that is our true nature, the more we experience and express it in our lives. It's an inside job. It's something that we have to do for ourselves. I mean, it's, certainly it's fine for us to admire traits in others, to see others' behaviors and to be inspired by, by them as long as we're clear that we're seeing aspects of God's nature that they're expressing in certain ways that also reside within us and that we're inspired by them to call forth those aspects of the divine that lie within us and to express them more fully. Not so healthy when it's from the viewpoint of, I need you to be the model of courage, of joy, of abundance, of whatever. I need you to be that for me to be inspired, for me to feel good. And don't you ever, ever slip from that, that tendency, that, that good that I see in you. Because then, if you do, I can't feel good. My goodness depends on you showing up in that way. You know, Jesus and all the great spiritual masters came and demonstrated to us the power of consciousness to transform in a positive way, you know, some of the negative conditions in the world to heal. They showed us how that power can be put and to use and activated in the world. But another part and very significant part of all their messages, which sometimes we tend to forget, is that they told us that that same power that we witnessed in them lies within each of us. You know, and that we were not to look at them to make everything better, that we had to awaken from within. Jesus used the term the Father within. It wasn't about him, it was about the Father within, and that he made it clear that that same presence of the Father lay within each and every one of us. And each of these masters had significant moments where their followers would have wanted them to shift the conditions, to perform that great miracle and transform everything, and they did nothing. And, you know, that was intentional, I believe. You know, can you imagine, knowing human nature, can you imagine when Jesus was on the cross and he didn't pull off that great miracle, make everything change, somehow get off and, you know, do whatever, to show everyone that he had a greater power than what was being done to him. Can you imagine how many of the people who were singing his praises one day suddenly just were devastated, filled with disdain? It was all a sham and feel contempt because they hadn't embraced the teaching for themselves. Those that continued on believing in what he taught had absolutely absorbed some of those teachings and were operating from that faith from within them. You know, Buddha died from food poisoning. I'm sure many of his followers would have thought, well, why didn't he just, you know, transform that? The message is twofold. One is that these masters were trying to say it's not all about changing conditions in the world because then we look to the world as our source of good. But the other part was, and you need to get this for yourself. It's not about me. It's not making it about me. And, you know, I love how this theme plays out also as we're approaching the holiday of Passover, which uh, falls the first night is on Friday night, same as Good Friday. This holiday that celebrates the Jewish people's exodus from Egypt, led by Moses and making their way, you know, taking those first steps for their journey into the pro promised land. You know, Moses was their hero, right? He was the one that help them to get out. He's the one that confronted Pharaoh over and over again. He's the one that rallied them together. And as they were leaving, he's the one that managed when they came up against the Red Sea to part the waters so that they could get across. And then their oppressors who were chasing after them were washed away. He's the one that got them out of slavery. But then when they're on the other side, 
with their oppressors no longer something they need to worry about, did they all go like, yeah, Moses, great. You did it for us now. What can we do? Let's come together. We believe in you. We can all come together and make this work. No, 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 no. This was followed by a period of 40 years of wandering in the desert. And let me tell you, there was a lot of whining. <laughs> Moses got a lot of flack. It was not this happy experience and, OK, we're together here. No, but he did keep helping them to move forward, helping them to put away you know, their fears and their resentments or their sense of, we need to go back, whatever, to move forward. But the most significant part of this story to me is that when they get to that promised land, Moses dies. Moses does not move into the promised land with the people. And to me, metaphysically, what that's about is, OK, he was the voice that got them to get to this point, but they had to get it for themselves. They had to have the consciousness of the promised land in them. And then he could fade into the background as they stepped into that promised land experience. And you know, this story, it, would, it also speaks very much to how this praise one minute, crucify the next, is not just something that we do to others. Have you noticed how much we do it internally to ourselves? See, if you've, if you've ever attended any of the services where I've um, explained the Passover story in more detail, metaphysically, it really is a story for us to not take literally, because if we do, it, it kind of makes God like this one that favors some, not so much for others, and not so all loving and all powerful as we would like to believe. But when you look at it metaphysically, Moses is that part of us that whatever our conditions, circumstances right now in the finite world, knows there's always some greater degree of love, some greater degree of joy, some greater degree of abundance or wholeness or health or whatever that we can experience. Egypt and Pharaoh represent the way things are today, and the Pharaoh is the one that doesn't want things to change, is afraid of change. And all the calamities we hear about as Moses keeps going to Pharaoh and asking to let his people go, that's the process of when we don't honor that impulse to move forward, when we give in to our fears, something in us just doesn't feel right. We don't feel expressed. So, Finally, we move forward, we build up the consciousness, and there's a point at which we build the consciousness to the degree that we can say, OK, that's it. I'm not giving into my fears anymore. I'm committing to that greater experience of love in my life. I'm committing to that new way of creative expression, career, whatever. I'm committing to this healthier lifestyle that would support me. So we make that commitment, we move in that direction, and at that point, our fears no longer have power to hold us back, and they're washed away. However, when we step into that new type of relationship, that new career, whatever, that new lifestyle that we know would be for our benefit, often it's uncharted territory. Often it feels awkward. Often don't we kind of get clumsy? Don't we fail? And have you noticed the minute that happens, how quickly we go to crucify ourselves? Oh, I just, I knew I shouldn't have done this. I know I'm not enough. I just will never live up to this. What was I thinking? On and on and on and on. But when we keep doing the work, when we listen to that Moses presence in us, I keep saying, this isn't true. There is this greater capacity to love. There is this greater capacity to creatively express. There is this capacity to forgive, whatever it is. When we listen to it and keep listening to it, at some point, it becomes part of who we are. It's no longer a voice in us. It just becomes integral to the way we show up in life. Now, I know that when we're looking at the idea of, oh, 
that person didn't show up as courageous as they usually do and I'm disappointed and maybe I'm crucifying to some degree or when we do that to ourselves, we can look at that and say, okay, yeah, that, that's something we might change. But when it's something that we observe a behavior where people are engaged in really hurtful, harmful behaviors, when we catch ourselves doing something that really was harmful to someone else, then suddenly this idea of crucifixion seems very justified, doesn't it? You know, when we recognize hurtful, harmful behaviors in ourselves or others, whether, you know, it's even on a small scale or a large scale, don't we just go straight to crucifixion? You know, lately we've seen a lot of exposure of individuals that have risen to fame, power, shown talent in some ways, and then demonstrated some very hurtful, inappropriate behaviors. And isn't our knee-jerk tendency to crucify those who at one point we might have held in high esteem? And it, it's tricky. It's a tricky process because it's not about denying the wrongdoing. It's not about pretending it didn't happen. But it's being able to recognize it, acknowledge it for what it is, but not condemn. You know, it's not about us saying that, you know, acts of disrespect, degradation of others, violence, that those are okay. It's not about us not taking action to prevent these things from happening again. It's about holding the space that can look at the wrongdoing and accept them as such with an attitude of, yet I know there's a greater good to be revealed. There's a greater good in these people and this person in me that's there to be revealed. That's the consciousness that promotes healing. You know, I was very moved years back when you know, the Catholic Church, when the stories of all the children who were abused and molested uh, by priests, when that came up. And I was at a service in a Catholic church where the Monsignor gave a sermon where he talked about, he said, you know, we cannot pretend this did not happen. We absolutely must take responsibility. We must recognize how much damage has been done and do what we can to help those who have suffered to heal. But he said, at the same time, I can't stop asking myself, what could I have done? What could we have done as an organization to create a safe space for those who are suffering from this, what he referred to as an illness of the soul, to come and to try to heal, to create a space where they could talk about it and move toward healing as opposed to having to hide it and then act out. And, you know, it really drove home to me the point that when, when we get caught up in the energy of condemnation, we're not focusing on the energy of looking at the issue from the viewpoint of how to heal it. You know, in such times, we're actually holding ourselves hostage to others' behaviors. You need to change. You need to be more like this. You need to be a different person. Or I'm going to stay angry and hurt and hateful unless you change. That's really helping us to have a better experience of life, isn't it? And the same goes for when we discover those dark areas in ourselves. You know, when we get stuck crucifying ourselves for our transgressions, we hold ourselves hostage to the error instead of opening up to the greater good in us that can be called forth to heal. You know, I know I've shared before how much I appreciated that by the time my dad passed on, how much healing we had had in our relationship and how sweet and clean I felt about what we had. But I can tell you, I could right now, I could sit down, I'm not going to, but I could sit down and list the ways that he physically and emotionally abandoned me and my siblings. But my first step, I know, my first step in healing came when I realized there was no point in me expecting him to change or resenting him if he couldn't change in certain ways. 
And instead, when I stopped looking to him to be that for me, the support that I didn't get from him that he wasn't capable of giving at that time came through other sources because I wasn't saying it has to come from that place. And over the years, as I learned to really look at the many, many qualities that he had and to appreciate them and acknowledge them, and even more importantly, as I was introduced to this teaching, as I looked at some of the behaviors, the things that he didn't do well, and I knew that there was a greater presence in him, I managed to call that forth from him. We had discussions where, because I was so, so clear that there was a greater presence in him than the behavior he was demonstrating at times, that that came forth. And he did the same for me. Because guess what? I don't always show up fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> We're all on a journey of awakening. And along the way, we'll discover ways that we and others express God's nature beautifully and ways that we don't. And I think it serves us to recognize in each of us there lies a hero and sometimes a villain that can rear its ugly little head. But in light of others, when their behaviors are inappropriate, for us to hold the idea of, I know that God's nature in you is bigger than your behavior. I offer you the blessing. May you realize that goodness in yourself for yourself, in your own time, in your own way. And for ourselves, when we recognize our transgressions, to work from the attitude of, I call forth God's goodness in me that's greater than this mistake I've made. I call forth God's goodness in me that's greater than this mistake I have made. So I can learn, I can grow, and I can make good of this error. As we do that, we extricate ourselves from suffering when we, the suffering that we incur when we make our well-being dependent on us and others always showing up at our best. We also open the space and consciousness for healing, acknowledging and inviting that greater good in us and them to come forth. And when we can operate from that level of consciousness as we navigate through life, and I would tell you, from this French-American minister's point of view, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that is the supreme example of savoir-faire. <laughs> Thank you. So let's turn within. as we bring our awareness to that part of us that every moment seeks to experience joy, wholeness, well-being in every way possible, that part of us that seeks to love and be loved, and to recognize that as a presence, a force that animates everything in creation, that there truly is only one life, it is God's life, and that life is expressing itself throughout the universe. We all live in God, and God lives in us. And I know that as we come together today, that where there are areas that we tend to put ourselves or others up on pedestals based on some, based on some human action, some human behavior, and then crucify when we or others don't show up at their best, we are willing to let that go and know that no matter what, if it's good, we celebrate that as the goodness of God coming through us and others and around us. And if we're not seeing the good expressed, we know there's a greater good in those places, in those situations, in those beings that is ready to be revealed. And as we do so, I know that we create the space and consciousness for the healing of our differences, for the healing of how we go to condemnation and feel separate from one another and rather find the way 
to take anything that looks ungodly and transform it, call forth the God essence to transmute it into something that it reflects more love and light. I know that we are all blessed by coming together today. I know that our prayer is a blessing for all those situations in the world that call to our attention where God's essence isn't being fully expressed by us knowing that God is there, God's nature is revealed. We know this prayer is a healing prayer for our family and loved ones. We bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, knowing that all paths lead us to the same God and the same truth. And it's with a heart filled with gratitude for knowing this truth that I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. Together we say, Amen.